In May 1957, Hammer Film Productions, a British production company that had spent most of the previous two decades making respectable, if unremarkable, films belonging to a wide variety of genres, comedies, mysteries, film noir, a bit of sci-fi, released a modestly budgeted adaptation of Mary Shelley's classic novel Frankenstein. The film cost only £65,000, or about $270,000, to produce, featured some recognizable actors but no major stars, and soon became the biggest hit in the history of the studio. The film was Curse of Frankenstein, and it not only lifted the fortunes of its production company by kicking off the series of films we now refer to as Hammer Horror, it also made a star out of its lead actor. Portraying Baron Victor Frankenstein in the film was an actor who had been working since the early 1940s, mostly in supporting roles on film and later television. An actor who would soon become Hammer's greatest star and one of the most recognizable faces and voices in genre cinema, Peter Cushing. While Curse of Frankenstein was Cushing's first leading role in a film, the first film I ever saw him in was probably Star Wars, which he made 20 years later. Growing up in the 1980s, Star Wars movies were part of my world from the very beginning. I had Yoda pajamas, for Christ's sake. I didn't discover the Hammer films until the early 1990s, and when I did, it still took me a bit to put together that the guy I was watching create a monster in Curse of Frankenstein was the same guy who used the Death Star to make Alderaan go kablooey in Star Wars. Actually, that's probably not accurate now that I think about it. While Curse of Frankenstein was the first film in Hammer's horror franchise, I didn't see it until many years after I had seen Peter Cushing's other career-defining turn in Hammer's follow-up to Curse of Frankenstein, 1958's Dracula, better known on this side of the Atlantic as Horror of Dracula. I don't know what audiences in 1957 and 58 felt when they saw Hammer's Frankenstein and Dracula films for the first time, but I can tell you how revelatory the experience of watching Horror of Dracula was for me at age 11 or so, after I convinced my pap to take me to a local video store so I could rent it. There have been countless pages written over the last several decades about the aesthetic differences between Hammer Horror and the equivalent franchise from the previous generation, Universal Horror. The classic Universal Horror films are in black and white, shot almost entirely on sound stages and the studio backlot, and, especially in the earliest films, can feel a bit stiff and stagey. The Hammer films, on the other hand, are all in brilliant, bright, full color, with some scenes shot on location and a sense of heightened, pulse-pounding melodrama infused throughout. It's not that the Universal Horror films are bad. Some of them are among my favorite movies ever. But there's undeniably a life, an energy, a vibrance to the Hammer films that the Universal films lack. Do I need to mention the bright red blood dripping from Dracula's fangs? Or have we had that cited as a defining image of the franchise enough by now? Because it is pretty awesome. And yeah, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better on-screen Dracula than Christopher Lee. But, even though I took note of those qualities immediately when I began watching the Hammer horror films, what really set them apart from their predecessors at Universal was Peter Cushing. Cushing was only in his mid-40s when he began starring in Hammer horror films. That made him a decade and a half older than Colin Clive when he played Dr. Frankenstein in the Universal version, but like I said, I didn't see Curse of Frankenstein until later. My introduction to Hammer was Horror of Dracula. And in Horror of Dracula, Peter Cushing plays Dr. Van Helsing. Before Cushing, the most famous on-screen Van Helsing was Edward Van Sloan, who played the role in Universal's legendary 1931 version of Dracula opposite Bela Lugosi. Van Sloan was only a few years older than Cushing was when he played the role, but Van Sloan played Van Helsing as an old man white hair, a slight stoop in his posture, an air of grandfatherly wisdom about him. Compared to that, Cushing's take on Van Helsing was a revelation. It's not that Cushing comes across as youthful in Horror of Dracula, not exactly. He seems mature, confident, but he's also decisive and driven and energetic when the scene calls for it. There are several sequences 
in Horror of Dracula that feature Van Helsing racing up a flight of stairs, or bursting through a door, or sprinting through the rooms of Dracula's gothic castle in pursuit of the fiend he's been chasing all these years. And while those scenes may not qualify as top-notch action set pieces, especially by today's standards, they are nonetheless incredibly exciting within the context of the story, and they demonstrate what a thrilling physical actor Cushing was capable of being. His Van Helsing is dynamic and courageous and willing and able to fight Dracula physically as well as match wits with him. And there's no better example of this than the ending of Horror of Dracula. Spoiler warning if you've never seen it, or any other Dracula movie, I guess, because they all kinda end the same. Dracula dies, but it's how he dies in this version. And those of you who have seen it know what I'm talking about. Van Helsing has chased Dracula back to his castle, and of course, it's only moments from sunrise, so Dracula runs inside with Van Helsing right on his heels. They struggle. Dracula chokes him out and is about to put the bite on him, but Van Helsing comes to and throws him off. They stand there facing each other, Dracula eyeing him, fangs bared like a wild animal. Then Van Helsing notices the sunlight seeping in from behind the heavy curtains. He climbs onto the table, charges to the end, leaps, grabs the curtains and rips them down, filling the room with the morning sun, which is just Dracula's least favorite thing ever. Dracula tries to back out of the light, but Van Helsing snatches a pair of candlesticks off the table and uses them to make a cross with which he holds Dracula at bay, forcing him to remain in the sunlight as it reduces him to dust. And holy shit, if that isn't the best ending to a Dracula movie ever, I don't know what to tell you. It's one of my favorite endings from any movie, period. It's so well staged, and Christopher Lee's Dracula is so maliciously malevolent, and Cushing's Van Helsing so quick-witted and brave, and the whole movie has been building to this moment, and we want Van Helsing to win, and he does, and does it in spectacular fashion, and shit, why has Best Dracula Movie even been a conversation since this movie came out? We should be arguing over who gets second place, because this is the winner right here. And for purposes of this video, I am excluding both versions of Nosferatu from the running, because yeah, they're both better than Horror of Dracula, but technically they aren't Dracula movies. The original Murnau version changes the names and locations and is obviously based on Dracula, but also becomes its own thing. And the Herzog version does go back to the original names, but it also keeps the setting and most of the other changes from the Murnau version, and it's more of an homage to the original Nosferatu than it is an adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula novel. And anyway, this is a video about Peter Cushing, not Klaus Kinski, so I want Horror of Dracula to be first, even if I have to cheat a little bit to justify it, okay? Is that all right with you? Jesus. Cushing would eventually play Van Helsing in a total of five films for Hammer. None of the four that followed were anywhere near as good as Horror of Dracula, but I'd still recommend checking them out if you're a fan of 1960s and 70s horror movies, because even when they're bad, Hammer films are still usually a lot of fun. He would also play Baron Frankenstein a total of six times, and if you want to see proof of what a subtle and versatile actor Peter Cushing was, compare his characterization of Van Helsing to that of Baron Frankenstein. It's not that Cushing's Frankenstein is evil, exactly, but he is amoral and capable of a level of ruthlessness and cruelty that it's hard to imagine from Van Helsing. And to call him single-minded wouldn't even get close to adequately describing his obsessive fixation with his macabre life's work. The guy just can't stop reanimating corpses. It never works out. People always end up getting murdered, and usually the creature has to be destroyed, but by the start of the next movie, there's the Baron in another laboratory, absolutely convinced that this time when he puts a murderer's brain into a new body, it's all gonna work out fine. Cushing appeared in many films for Hammer, apart from the Frankenstein and Dracula series from the 1950s through the 1970s. He played an archaeologist in the Hammer version of The Mummy, and the Sheriff of Nottingham in Sword of Sherwood Forest, Hammer's Robin Hood movie. 
He also made movies for studios other than Hammer, of course. He starred in two Doctor Who movies in the 1960s, and like I said already, he was Grand Moff Tarkin, the commander of the Death Star in Star Wars. But there's one more role he played, which for me and lots of other fans is a defining one, and it's a role he first played in a Hammer production. And that production was 1959's The Hound of the Baskervilles, and that role was Sherlock Holmes. Cushing only played Holmes in three different projects throughout his career, and that will always make me sad, because not only were his talents well-suited to the character, look at him. Dig that profile. He's like a Sidney Paget illustration come to life, for God's sake. I have all the love and respect in the world for Jeremy Brett's portrayal of Holmes on TV in the 1980s and 90s, but the only thing keeping Peter Cushing from being my definitive on-screen Sherlock Holmes is the fact that he just didn't play him all that often. Or, I should say, he didn't play him all that often in productions that have survived to this day. Other than Hammer's Hound of the Baskervilles, Cushing played a retired Holmes in the 1984 TV movie The Masks of Death, one of his final performances. And he also played Holmes on TV for the BBC in 1968. Unfortunately, though Cushing starred in 16 episodes of that BBC series, only six episodes are still known to exist. Happily, among those six is another version of Hound of the Baskervilles, as well as an adaptation of The Blue Carbuncle, one of my favorite Holmes stories. But unfortunately, those half a dozen TV episodes and two movies are all we have of Peter Cushing playing Sherlock Holmes. And that's a shame, because he was a great Sherlock Holmes, and maybe never better than in the first time he played the role, Hammer's Hound of the Baskervilles. You can tell just by looking at the credits of this movie that it's going to be a good one before you even watch the thing. Starring Cushing, alongside Christopher Lee as Henry Baskerville, written by Peter Bryan, who also co-wrote Brides of Dracula, Cushing's second film as Van Helsing, and directed by Terrence Fisher, who directed Horror of Dracula and Curse of Frankenstein, and Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and Curse of the Werewolf, and Frankenstein, Created Woman, and a bunch of other great films for Hammer, and was basically one of the greatest horror filmmakers who ever lived. Yes, Hammer's Hound of the Baskervilles does take a few liberties from the source material in order to nudge it into the horror category, because horror movies were Hammer's bread and butter by this point, and that might upset purists but purists can get sucked into the Grimp and Meyer for all I care. It's Peter Cushing as Sherlock Holmes, directed by Terrence Fisher, and it's great. Cushing's take on Holmes is similar to his Van Helsing, only with the warmth and kindness swapped out for arrogance and condescension. Fisher's direction is tight, the locations are gothic and atmospheric, and the film is engrossing, even if you already know the solution to the mystery, which you probably do, since it's one of the most well-known mystery stories ever written. It's my favorite Sherlock Holmes movie, and one of my favorite adaptations of a Holmes story, period, behind only a few of the very best episodes of the Jeremy Brett series. And were it not for the sheer volume of Jeremy Brett's amazing body of work playing the character, Peter Cushing would be my favorite Sherlock Holmes, and probably pretty easily at that. So, that's a hell of a career, right? Definitive or damn near definitive portrayals of Dr. Van Helsing, Baron Frankenstein, and Sherlock Holmes, plus playing Darth Vader's boss in Star Wars before George Lucas retconned Vader into Galactic Jesus. Of his most famous roles, Cushing himself seems to have been the most like Van Helsing. It's difficult to imagine Peter Cushing staking somebody, no matter how badly they have it coming, but like his Van Helsing, he was by all accounts a decent and gentle man. And he seems to have had a healthy attitude toward the typecasting that defined his career in the eyes of his most devoted fans. In a 1976 interview, Cushing mused, Who wants to see me as Hamlet? Very few. But millions want to see me as Frankenstein. So that's the one I do. There's a scene in Horror of Dracula, probably my favorite scene in the film, apart from the ending. In it, Cushing shows us the breadth of his emotional range as an actor, moving from tender humanity to unbending determination in the space of a couple of minutes. Van Helsing and Arthur Holmwood, played by Michael Goff, 
who would go on to play Alfred in the Tim Burton, Joel Schumacher Batman films, have chased Arthur's sister, Lucy, who has become a vampire, back to her tomb. Lucy is repelled by Van Helsing's cross and flees, and while Arthur runs after her, Van Helsing stays behind to comfort Tanya, a child who was to be Lucy's victim. Kneeling in front of Tanya, Van Helsing takes off his coat and wraps it around her. He tells her with a fatherly smile that the fur collar makes her look like a teddy bear. He hands her his cross, showing her how to hold it in front of herself to make sure a vampire can't get close enough to eat her, though he doesn't say that, of course. And he turns and points to a spot in the distance and, in a calm and kindly tone of voice that lets us know he actually cares about Tanya, tells her, if you watch over there, you'll see the sun come up. And then he pats the child gently on the head, walks into the crypt, and hammers a stake through Lucy's heart. <laughs>